Someday soon, my Savior will call out my Hello everyone, glad you've tuned in. Hope that, uh, that this Bible class is a blessing to you. I mentioned last week that my name is Jerry Lockhart and that we do this Bible class on graceforall.net and Grace for All is the name of our ministry. And um, we invite you to call us. I think the phone number is going to appear from time to time on the screen. We invite you to call us if you have questions about what we preach. Um, I have no um, axes to grind and no uh, churches to build. I'm just a, a semi-retired preacher who doesn't intend to quit preaching until he draws his last breath. So appreciate you being here. And we'll just look at some, some more scripture here tonight concerning our position when it comes to what the Lord's plan is. Last week I did a, a little short synopsis of the first uh, 39 books of the Bible and then got a little bit more into detail about the scripture from Matthew uh, uh, over into some of the things that the Apostle Paul wrote. The Apostle Paul is our apostle. When I say our apostle, I mean he's not an apostle to the Israelites. Though he went to the Jew first, he went to the Jew first with the gospel which he was going to bring to the Gentiles. And so the reason for that is a little bit more detailed, and we'll get into that maybe in about two weeks. But nevertheless, what I want you to see tonight is what this has given you, what this has given me, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then he will save us. My personal testimony is that I was raised in the home of a, of a Baptist preacher, and, and it was called Separate Baptist. There's not any in Alabama, but there is some... Uh, close by, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, and, um, and maybe a few in Tennessee and a few in North Carolina. And that's a different sort of a Baptist. And I'm not going to go into the details about that, but that's the way I was raised. Now, when, when I came out of that, and when I say came out of it, I just kind of quit going to church when I got into the rebellious teenage years. And I didn't go back to church until I got married, which wasn't very long, got married pretty young. But my wife insisted that I go to church. And so as a consequence of that, I, I would see and hear things and I would know that I was being condemned by them. In other words, I was not a believer. I was not a believer. It isn't that I would have said there wasn't a Lord or a God or even the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I never doubted all of that. I believed in Jesus. But then there was a night when my hypocrisy had gotten me down. I was about as low as I could go, and I didn't know what to do about it. And uh, everything that I had tried before had seemed so phony. As a matter of fact, of course, it was phony. But the point is, I, didn't, I was at the end of the rope. I couldn't do anything else. So on the last Thursday night of October 1964, when I was 22 years old, I gave up. And all I did was say, Lord, save me. And I didn't have to say that, by the way. That's just what I knew to say. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved was the only verse that came to mind. That's the only one. Later on, there may have been other verses come to mind. I don't recall. I joined a church the next Sunday. The people in that church never even asked me if I was saved. That should have been some sort of a clue to me, but I was just oblivious to it. I was 22 years old, and I thought I knew most everything, didn't know anything. Thought I knew the Bible, didn't know anything. And about nine years later, I ran into a man who could teach the Bible from a dispensational viewpoint, and the way to study the Bible dispensationally changed my life. Within a few short months, I knew I had to preach, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I believe in testimonies. I believe in your testimony if you've got one. If you, have, if you know that you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then I believe in your testimony. And I believe you ought to tell it. I believe you ought to write it down so that your family has it. I believe you ought to give it to people. You know why? One of these days, if the rapture of the church does not take place and we get caught up out of here, one of these days, somebody's going to stand up in a pulpit or in, in back of a little old desk like this, and they're going to talk about you. And they don't know what to say about you unless you've told them your testimony. If you can assure them that you know you've trusted Christ as your Savior, they're going to be filled with joy at your passing. <laughs> not because they're not going to see you anymore, but because they'll know You've gone to be with the Lord. 
Now, the point about all of that is I want you to have assurance of your salvation. I can't give you that, but the scripture can. So we're going to look at several things in the scriptures about your salvation. All right, turn to Romans, look in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 3, you'll notice, if you will, that Paul is describing the fact that the law can't save you. As a matter of fact, if you look back at verse 9, he says, What then are we, meaning Jews, Better than they, meaning Gentiles? No, and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. I know people that don't believe that. But let me tell you something about your nature. If you've been taught to do something good, well and good. Praise the Lord. Get on with it. But you had to be taught to do that. Did you ever notice you didn't have to teach kids how to do something wrong? In other words, a father never sits around watching his little baby, his little toddler, about to get into stuff. And he says, yes, yes, get in. No, no. He says, nah, get out of there. Get out. Of and away it goes. You've got to stop them from doing the bad things. You never have to teach them to be bad. You have to teach them to be good. Well, you know why that is? That's our nature. Is that good? Mm, nope, it's bad. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. By our nature, we don't do good. Left alone, we probably won't do any good. You know, left alone, we'll be reminded of the good we should do, and we'll do it for a while, but left alone enough, left our own devices enough, we'll probably do what we really wanted to do in the first place. We ain't no good. I ain't, you ain't, your mom and daddy ain't, your kids ain't, your grandkids ain't. That's tough, isn't it? Why? Because our daddy Adam, he changed our nature. Way back in the Garden of Eden, he changed our nature. And we are by nature children of the flesh. And the flesh, Jesus said the flesh prophets Nothing. Isn't that amazing? The flesh profits nothing. Why then are we left here in this flesh? Because we have this fantastic word here of promise by the Lord to tell people. And that's why we're here. Look down at verse 20. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law. What are the deeds of the law? Thou shalt not. Thou shalt. How are we doing on that one? You know, they say there's 613 laws. I didn't count. Several people have. 613 laws, not just 10. Well, how are you doing on the 10? I shall have no other gods before me. I shall make unto thyself no graven image of anything in heaven above, the earth below, or beneath the earth, or under the earth. No graven images. How are we doing on that? Then we got, keep this. remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. How are we doing with that one? When is the Sabbath? You can't even find a way to find out the seventh day. Do you know that? Calendars have been so fouled up over the years you couldn't possibly find the seventh day. Then there's the others. You know, like, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. How about that one? Know anybody that's ever coveted? And then you break it down and go through all those other 603 and all of a sudden there's some things that you think, oh my gosh, I've got on wool and cotton at the same time. That's a big problem with the law. And on and on it goes. Listen, folks, the law was to show God's righteousness. The law never showed us we were righteous. Showed us we couldn't be. Look at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty, may become guilty before God. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about our guilt? We can't stop this guilt. You know what? If you try to stop this guilt, you're going to find that you just fall short all the time. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God's in his righteousness. We come short of it naturally. Look, if you will, verse 21. But now, 
the righteousness of God, there's that glorified thing, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. How could God without that law, he put the law together by Moses back here, how could he now manifest that righteousness without the law? Notice verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Wow. Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Did he? Yes, he did. He fulfilled the law. The Lord Jesus Christ in his fleshly life never committed a sin. He never broke the law. As a matter of fact, as he described the law to the twelve in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, he broadened how much it would cover. And he himself lived up to it. Now notice what, it, what this says about him. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. So here's Paul out here preaching Jesus Christ and he's saying it's unto all, but it's not upon all. There's no universal salvation involved here. It's upon all who believe. Ain't that something? Yes, it is. For there's no difference. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, God's righteousness, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his, that's God's righteousness, that he, God, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where's boasting then? It is excluded. We'll cover more of that later. But if you will now, look over, if you will, in Romans chapter 8 and keeping in mind what you just read. We're justified freely by his grace and on and on. Now look in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now a lot of people turn that around and they say, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, if they walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's not what it said. It said who? Who's the who? Them is the who. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Them which are in Christ Jesus walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How do I know that? The rest of the chapter proves it to me. Look over, if you will, in verse um, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And right away you're trying to gauge yourself as to whether or not you are or you aren't, and on and on and on. Whether you are or you aren't actively in your life's flesh, minding the things of the flesh instead of the Spirit, is not what he's referring to. He's referring to whether or not you are in Christ, and therefore your walk is after the Spirit. If you're in Christ, keep reading. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's a natural position. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh. Say, well, I feel like it. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you in the spirit? If you're in Christ, you're in the Spirit. How did I get in Christ? Remember last week? The gospel of Christ is how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. The gospel of Christ is that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. So how did you get in the Spirit? Did you trust Christ as your Savior? Have you ever, do you have a moment in time when you remember that time when you got so low that you needed a Savior that Jesus Christ was the only one you could see? And someone told you that he died for your sins. Maybe you heard it when you were five and you didn't get saved until you're 25. Maybe you heard it repeatedly, 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 and finally it hit, got through your thick skull and you just simply trusted Christ. I believe that's the way I was. 
So when you trusted Christ, you became His. You became His. And you're in Christ, not in the flesh. Verse 8 again. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be it, the Spirit of God dwell in you. <clears throat> if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Well, how do you know that? In other words, how do you know? Just because that those words say, if you're, if you're in Christ Jesus, you walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How do you know that? Turn Hold on to Romans chapter 8 and turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Great verse of Scripture here. Really great. All about you and your salvation. Notice, if you will, in verse 12. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Now watch, verse 13. In whom, in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Wow! When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were sealed. It's like this. Here's the seal of God Almighty. Here's you and your sinful self. You are so low, you can't get up. <clears throat> and you try and you try and you try and you can't get up. So the Lord, in His marvelous grace, sees that lowly condition. And He helps you to understand you must trust Him. Trust Him. Fall off into hell believing Christ will save you. And when you trust Christ, that one moment when you trust Christ, the Holy Spirit seals you and He's got a grip on you and He will not let you go. You can't get out of the grip of the Holy Spirit. You're still in the flesh. Anything might happen in the flesh. But the Lord holds you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that He bought you with a price and you're His. And He tells you repeatedly, don't follow after the world. You belong to Christ. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, that's your condition. You're in the flesh. Bodily, you can see it. But you're in Christ spiritually because of the seal of the Holy Spirit that came on you when you trusted Christ as your Savior. What a magnificent thing that is. Now, I told you last week the Bible is a dispensational book. I believe in studying it dispensationally. That verse, Ephesians 1 verse 13, says that you are sealed. The word sealed or seal is going to appear in your Bible as concerning people and the Lord only in Romans to Philemon. Oh, you find the word in there talking about the seal of a king and things like that. You'll also find in the book of John that Jesus Christ is sealed. You'll find the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ the Son. Him hath the Father sealed. John chapter 6, I believe it is, or 5, chapter 5, something or other. Then you'll find all these people over here that Paul preached to. Romans is the first book in your Bible that Paul wrote that you come to. And Philemon, a little tiny book, is the 13th book that Paul wrote. And that's the last one that he wrote. Romans to Philemon have in it all the proofs necessary to understand how that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit and you cannot lose that salvation. There is no way you can lose your salvation. People say, well, I don't know about that. That's well, think about it. Look, if you will, now that you're back in Ephesians, look over, if you will, in Colossians, which is the, the books go Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So look in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians 2, I know a man, great preacher, loved listening to him preach. He was sitting in a congregation one night, many, many, many moons ago, and the preacher was using this scripture. And he'd been doubting his salvation, been doubting whether or not he trusted Christ, and on and on. And the preacher was using this scripture that I'm getting ready to read here. 
And in the middle of hearing that scripture, almost as if for the first time, this young man said to himself, you fool. You think you can do something about that? Jesus Christ did it all. All you've got to do is receive it. And he trusted Christ as his Savior and he's been preaching the gospel of Christ ever since. I may be talking to somebody right now that that's the case with you. You need a Savior. You need the seal to be real for you. You need to know you belong to the Lord. Well, forget your religiosity. I don't give a flip where you went to church. I don't care how loud your preacher was or how soft-spoken he was. I don't care about any of that stuff. Believe that Christ died for your sins. Believe that God raised him again for your justification. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. There's nothing, nothing to do about that but to do it. Trust him. And then you're sealed. Look at this passage. He's talking about the world and the world around us. And he says the last word of verse 9 is the word Christ. Then, ver I'm sorry, verse 8. The last word of verse 8 is Christ. Then he says verse 9. For in him, that's in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Watch. And ye are complete in him. You're complete in Christ. If you've trusted Christ, my friends, you're complete in Christ. Notice, which is the head of all principality and power, verse 11, in whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, which makes your circumcision spiritual circumcision. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, Christ was circumcised as a child, as a baby in eight days. That was the law. Cut the law perfectly, you know. And Christ was circumcised as a baby under the condition provided by Moses' law. But then this circumcision came. Christ is on that cross. Here's the cross of Christ. He's hanging there on this cross. And he is cut away. Christ was cut away from that cross. The body was put into a tomb. His soul went to hell. You can read that twice in your Bible. Don't throw rocks at me. It says hell. He went to hell. And his spirit, his spirit, went back to God who gave it. He was circumcised on the cross. Look now, that verse again, verse 11. In whom also ye, spiritually speaking, ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by this circumcision. Keep reading and you being dead in your sins, and the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, God Almighty, quickened together with him, Christ. How could he do that? When Christ was circumcised on this cross he died body went to the grave soul goes to hell spirit goes back to God he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and then he was raised from the dead notice the operation of God in verse 12 risen with Christ Ye are risen with Christ through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Did he just say that we out here who are believers and who get this seal, did he just say that we were raised from the dead? Yep, he did. Why? Because we were raised with Christ. Christ stood upon the earth and was glorified to come back. He he preached to the apostles, and then he goes into heaven. He appears to the apostle Paul above the brightness of the noonday sun from heaven. Here it says that you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God when God raised him from the dead. Verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
have he quickened together with him. God Almighty quickened you with Christ. How in the world could he do that? We hadn't even been born yet. I was born 1,909 years after Christ was crucified, after Christ was raised from the dead. How did I get to be raised from the dead with Christ? Oh, last phrase. Having forgiven you all trespasses. How many is all? It's all. How many of your sins are forgiven? All of them. How many is that? I don't know. Got some yet to do, so don't know how many I'm going to do. Are they forgiven too? Uh-huh. How you know? Having forgiven you all trespasses. How many of your sins were in the future when Paul wrote these words to you? All of them were. Then how many of your sins are forgiven? All of them are. How'd the Lord do that? Oh, it's a marvelous story. It's a wondrous thing to behold. It starts with the promises of God unto Abraham. Actually, it, promise, it starts with the statement God made to the devil in Genesis chapter 3. But it's really unfolded in the promises God made to Abraham. Then it's unfolded more through what David and Solomon wrote in the Psalms and the Proverbs. Then it's unfolded even more when Jesus Christ himself comes to this earth, the Son of Almighty God, virgin born, brought into the world at a time that the world just looks horrible, almost as bad as it does now. And as a consequence of that, the glory of the Lord shined brighter. But then Jesus was crucified, buried, but God raised him from the dead. And now when the Apostle Paul tells us about the possibility of our salvation, he tells us that God has forgiven us all trespasses. Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Wow. That's what you have in Christ. That's what you have in Christ on purpose. It's a seal. You've got the seal. If you've trusted Christ. If you've never trusted Christ, you're wasting your time trying to study the Bible. That's exactly right. I'm not interested in you studying this Bible until you've trusted Christ as your Savior. You say, well, I've got to learn. Okay, come on back and learn. But let me tell you something. The realness of this word, the realness, the thing that comes alive in your life is brought to you by the Spirit of God, which you don't have if you're lost. But if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, or if right now you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll save you. Trust Him. He died for your sins. Trust Him. And when you trust Him, and that seal of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then the Word of God will be made clear to you. Slowly but surely, but yes, it will. Look at, back, if you will, and go to, uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul never let anyone think that he was somebody's uh, magical man. He was simply relaying the revealed word of God unto people willing to read it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Do you know that he said that the power of God was the gospel of Christ? The power of God unto salvation is the gospel of Christ. So here we have that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved. And the moment we're saved, we're sealed. So when we have the seal and we know we're the Lord's, we can study his word and know what he said to us. I thank you for watching. Hope you come back next week. Get a, goodbye, everybody. Someday soon I'll be in heaven. Someday soon.